Before AI was more of a, as I might say, an accessory. Now AI is actually a necessity for the sustainability of any organization. Before we start the show, I'd like to talk to you about Brandwatch, which is a digital consumer intelligence company. It helps businesses better understand their consumers and buyers with clever software that enables them to analyze conversations from across the web and social media. To find out more, visit brandwatch.com and you can sign up for up to the minute consumer insights in your inbox each week at brandwatch.com forward slash bulletin. And it's worth mentioning that my business, Automated Creative, uses Brandwatch every single day and our business would be impossible to deliver without it. So it's of real pride that I welcome them as partners for this week's episode. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object Podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a weekly podcast about the future of advertising. Every week or so, what we do is chat to a really eventual uh, guest about what their vision is for the future of the industry and, and go a bit deeper into the subject that they're most excited about. And I'm, I'm on a call with Fatima Baz, who is Digital Innovation Manager in North Africa and Middle East. Fatima, for anyone who doesn't know who you are and what you do, please could you give me just a bit of a background to help the audience understand your journey and, and where you are today? Hello, Tom. Yes, for sure. So my name is Fatima Baz. Um, uh, I'm a computer engineering graduate who got into the field of uh, innovation and digital transformation at a very early stage in my career. I have evolved, uh, my career has evolved from uh, working with startups on e-commerce platforms uh, into uh, working on digital transformation programs for big organizations. Uh, I touch base on AI and its influence uh, on uh, supply chain, uh, marketing, and e-commerce. I'm keen to know what has been the best investment of your own time, energy, or money in your career? You know, my best investment, and it's something that I have uh, been working on for the past three years, it's uh, books, buying books, reading a lot of books throughout my uh, every year, actually. I have uh, like a limit or I have like a goal to read more than 30 books a year. Um, it's amazing how much uh, how much of transformation and, and uh, advancement does that offer to, to every person. Um, as an innovator, I, I assume it's really crucial for you to stay up to date with the latest innovations and what's happening around the world. Uh, these books can, can uh, vary from personal development books into books that touch on the economy and a lot of other issues that are happening in the world. Uh, I always choose the books that are recommended by Elon Musk. Uh, I find him to be my idol, to be honest. He's a very visionary uh, personnel. Um, and the latest books I've been touching upon are related to AI, um, aliens, the presence of aliens in our world, and uh, how we can better uh, control uh, artificial intelligence now. I've never had anyone talk about aliens on the podcast, so we've got to dive into that a little bit. Tell me, tell me what what has Elon Musk been telling you to read about aliens? You know, he's he's the type of person who believes in the probability of having a foreign life uh, other than life on Earth. Uh, from a probability perspective, it's actually something that's very probable and can exist. Uh, the universe is very fast; uh, it's very actually big, and uh, yeah, it's something that he's touching upon. He's also, uh, in, in some of the books he recommends, uh, when he talks about alien life, he is referring into artificial intelligence and the way artificial intelligence can actually take over a lot of tasks that are happening in the world and be able to have their own conscience. So he talks about the, the, he talks about the field of xenobots, which are robots that are uh, first constructed via frog cells and then have the ability via AI to, to multiply on their own without being programmed to do so. So, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting field and it's very futuristic. Sorry, go back to the uh, self-replicating AI frogs. That sounds fascinating. So uh, just, yeah, help us understand that a bit better. I'm curious. So, uh, you know, Xenobots, they are, uh, they're kind of AI organisms. They're, they're made of frog cells that are uh, programmed to do certain functions. 
that uh, some of our organs uh, are not able to do. So assume that you have a failure, a kidney failure. So this field, of uh, it's a medical field that allows us to replace that organ with uh, certain cells that will be able to do the function of the kidney, for example. And they have noticed, uh, a lot of medical practitioners have noticed that these cells are able to do some functions that they're not programmed to do. And it's something, by the way, that is that has been there for a long period of time. And Mark Zuckerberg has touched upon this stuff. He was talking about certain servers for Facebook that were able to uh, do certain tasks at a faster pace and not by following uh, the way they're programmed and not by following the code that they're programmed by. Uh, and here, touch, and here, here comes the subject of having AI or AI having a certain conscience. And a lot of the books that he recommended for 2022, they touch upon um, paying attention on how we're developing AI and always having certain rules to know how to, to be able to control, um, to control their ability to actually perform on their own. And how does the consciousness piece come into it? I, one of the things that always confuses me is that we all, we're all aware that we have a mind, but no one's been able to prove the existence of it yet. So the idea that we assume that someone thing else is going to have a mind that we can't prove seems, sci sci seems scientific, but at the same time, um, like there's a, there's a tension there. What, what's your view on that? You know, my view, I think it's something that has been embedded from a long period of time in science. Uh, you know, science has debated for a long period of time that certain particles, small particles, uh, they have conscience. Uh, it, there was, I think it's an experiment that was done by Newton's. Uh, it was regarding a beam of light. Uh, I might be wrong in some aspect, like with some names. I'm about, I'm sure about the experiment, but I'm not sure about who ran it. It's about uh, having a beam of light touching on, on a certain surface. And they will tell you that when the light articles, uh, particles were aware of somebody watching them, the way they have moved has varied. So uh, it's, a, it's a scientific sector that has been debated for a very long period of time. It has been existing, by the way, uh, since the 90s. It's not something new. But now in practice, uh, it's something that they are seeing happening. Uh, I, I deeply think that AI, since AI is designed in a way not only to make data-driven uh, data decision-making, that we uh, program, program them to do, they are able also to do data-driven decision-making that they think is better to better provide uh, business solutions. So since a lot of the decision-making that they do is not actually how we program them to do, and since we expect them to do some kind of smart decisions, I think this is not something that is very... Uh, impossible i think it's something that will happen uh, sooner or later yeah th this is i will have the uncomfortable problem of trying to bring this conversation back around to marketing and and obviously run, running a business that has automation at its core and, and use machine learning and artificial intelligence in our products but ultimately the the challenge that i talk to a lot of our clients about is the fact that that with AI, uh, there isn't any cognition, <laughs> not really. I and mean, they can they, they can understand that it can do clever things and make moves and suggestions that a human wouldn't, but it doesn't really understand. So, for example, when a GPT three, for example, which is for anyone who doesn't know, it is a open source algorithm that can generate copy, a really impressive copy, but it doesn't understand what it's saying it, it, it's a parlor trick still i mean it's incredible like you know if you want to generate free blog post copy you can easily do it but it doesn't actually understand it's not relating to those words it's not feeling those words it's not con it's not con it's not cognizant of what it means and it and so from gpt3 hasn't has no feelings it just it doesn't actually um uh, take on on board those words and their meaning so therefore quite often uh, something like gpt3 will fail when it comes to writing copy for a brand because it doesn't understand the context within which it's talking right so sure it could come up with lots of free copy lines for or quick copy lines for a brand but the the people at the brand or the agency would have to go through going no no yes no no because they they apply the cognition to the content 
so I, so so I'm, I'm rambling horribly. I was just be interviewing you, but you've you've got me really interested. So um, I guess I guess the question is is that um, does AI need to be cognizant to produce to perform useful marketing and advertising functions? Mm, very interesting question. I think the more you bring data and complexity to the structure of AI, the more you will be granted better results. That's known. For example, if you look at all the strategy of all the companies or organizations peer, they always used to have a team, one team that is into AI and digital innovation. And this team will give their feedback to the other teams, sales and marketing to better, uh, like better manage their campaigns. But now the structure has been different. Now the organizational structure uh, to actually have good uh, good results or a good business strategy, the structure is to have AI embedded in every department. And that means that will provide more complexity for AI. And to, in a way or another, it will provide it with more cognition to be able to better run uh, business figures. Before AI was more of a, as I might say, an accessory. Now AI is actually a necessity for the sustainability of any organization. That's, that's what I believe in. Um, Take, for example, the real-time bidding structure, right? Like we, they're deploying uh, machine learning to control bid price. They're deploying machine learning to maintain liquidity, to monetize the content. We're talking about advertising, right? And to make sure that there's safety on the platform because they will be able to filter uh, any bot, uh, any bot uh, actions. So I think the more you rely on or the more, the more complex your AI uh, your AI development or your AI, the way you're embedding AI in your business processes, the better results you will have. However, this is something I always stress. It's very important to make sure that you have enough data. So first of all, there's a lot of work that needs to be put in the structure of the organization. You have to have a structure that where you understand, you know the data that you are having, you understand all your systems, you understand this data, you analyze it properly to be able to develop the right uh, AI platforms that will fit with the strategy. So AI is not a strategy on its own. AI is an enabler for business strategy to be able to better achieve results. So do you have a best marketing tip that is related to this or unrelated to this? Like, you know, you read a lot. So do you have a marketing tip that has really helped you with your career? Something that you share quite often? My marketing tip would always be uh, to base everything on data, consolidate it and analyze it. Uh, I would say there's a lot of strategies that you can follow, like predictive analytics, uh, embed AI in a lot of your strategies, uh, have a strategy to improve your CR or conversion rate. These are all strategies, but the main tip in, in, in setting a marketing strategy and knowing what's best to do next is to rely on data and analyze, right? It will give you the ability to actually learn from what worked in the previously, it will give you also a vision of uh, what are the trends that you have seen, and it will give you a better ability to actually reduce your cost but improve your revenue by implementing the right thing. So you will not be able to actually improve uh, your strategy if you have not learned what works and what doesn't work from before. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Madfest. Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So we're at the halfway stage now, and normally here I would reveal what your shiny new object is, but we've kind of covered it really, certainly in title, and your shiny new object is how innovation and AI impact business and marketing. So let's let's carry on that conversation. So um, I think it's clear to the audience what, what your view is and how important it is. Um, but one of the things that um, I've been battling with is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, for example, this is a completely hypothetical case, but one I share often that imagine you're scrolling through Instagram and everything you see is red. And then you see an advert that's blue. Okay. An AI would tell you that your ad would always be blue, 
but it in reality it should have been anything that isn't red could have been yellow or pink or spotty or transparent or black and white it doesn't matter whereas in an advertising context the issue we have is that um you know you can get the data back from facebook or or google or, or wherever you're serving your ads that oh it was it was the it was the blue ad that worked but no it wasn't it was the fact it wasn't red that mattered so um what how do you as 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 a brand deal with that kind of conundrum where uh, yes you can get a lot of data you know, so much data on an audience but unless you've got the the data that provides the context how can you be sure that um you're making your database decisions on on the right recommendations from something like an ai mm, very very good question you know that and there are a lot of people who have argued that uh, the way ai is implemented in marketing is not actually granting results uh, and a lot of people have argued also that 94% of these recommendations weren't accurate recommendations as per application. Um, uh, I think it's, it's a matter, it's not about uh, the AI recommendations, it's about the system that you have built. Um, I'll just give you like, I'll give you a description of something that would actually describe the scenario. It's like when you want to do like innovation in AI and you build it on legacy systems that you do not know what is there in it, right? So what's built on, on uh, we, say, we say in Unilever, trash in, trash out. So if, if you're building something on something that you are not quite understanding, that's when actually you will not get the result that you are seeking. So in, in the example that you're providing, you're saying in a lot of cases, Facebook does not give you the right recommendation. It has a lot to actually do with what are your target audience on Facebook? Who are your target audience? And it has a lot, of, uh, a lot to do with the way you are seeing the data that Facebook is providing. It's something also that's like related to, I'll give you an example. So in a lot of the ads that people or that certain corporates show uh, or in affiliate marketing even, you will see that these ads have a lot of click-through rate, but the conversion rate is not working. That doesn't mean that um, my ad is not working. It actually means that the landing page that I'm converting them to might not be appealing. The price might not be working. So there are a lot of scenarios that you need to take into consideration. And that's where analysis is very important. As I said, the way you view this data and this analytical ability to be able to distinguish is quite important. Um, building the right AI is also necessary. And, and I stress here also the fact that we always assume that, especially in marketing, because AI implementation in marketing is not quite as complex as in other fields. Um, it's very important. We shouldn't forget that the human intervention here is important. So AI will not replace actually a, a human intervention here. You will have to have a human who will better analyze all this data and better do these recommendations. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's a flow in the strategy or a flow in, in seeing certain data or the way that you are classifying data. Uh, in other cases, you have to always test, see what works for you. Like I'll give you an example also. Uh, in Rocket Internet, I'm talking about Rocket Internet, the first company I used to work with. When I wanted to do any, uh, to implement any change on a landing page or creative on the website or anything, we didn't directly go or implement the change. You always have to have this uh, space, if I might say, where you are doing what we call A-B testing and it should be implemented on everything. And a lot of uh, double-click for advertising uh, platforms do it. You do not directly shift into the new creative that you have. What you do is you do this gradual shift because you want to make sure that this shift is successful. The only way to grant it is to compare what is what was done before and what's doing, being done now. So you direct half of the traffic into some uh, some strategy on the other half into another creative or another version of your website, for example, and you see which traffic is converting more. But to do that, for example, you have to make sure that all the rest of the variables are constant because only then will, you will know that the creative is the one who's driving the change. So uh, what I'm trying to explain here is like the way of thinking about any strategy or about any methodology that should be followed. You have to always make sure that you're not directly shifting into a new strategy. You have to test first. Only when it's successful, you can completely do the shift. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting that point. And I, I like the idea of the, the gradual shift across. And, and the point you made is, is one that we say all the time, like if you, if, if you haven't isolated the variables, then you can't be sure of the outcome. Whereas, whereas, um, like the reality is, you can only control the variables that you can control, right? And so that uh, I, I strongly believe that 
uh, the context within which your ads are seen is, is the important thing. And I think that there's a horrible reliance in the industry about pr- making predictions based on a past performance. So say, for example, I'm just going to make this up that you look at all, lots of burger advertising from the last two years across lots of different markets and lots of different regions. And then an AI would tell you, you know, what to put in a burger ad. But if, um, I don't know, there's a giant documentary on Netflix about like how bad burgers are for the environment that was really huge and was number one in that chart, then then, then that data would, would be misleading because you... You as the advertiser wouldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to control. So, our methodology is very much making the ads react to the moment, react to the context within which they're being seen, as opposed to creating a creating a learning model that like looks at the vapor trails of yesterday to predict what happens next. And I, I, I just think I just so, sorry. I don't, yeah, you've got me on my favorite subject. So I'm rambling on too much, but 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 I'm keen to know what you think about that. No, I think real time is always better in everything. Even now, like we, we, by the way, relying on past data doesn't require a complex AI. It's not, you cannot even call it AI because it's just, uh, if I might say, it's a strategy. It's di- discovering past trends and that does not require AI. AI is basically developing a, 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 an intelligence that is able to predict the future and tell you right now what is the best decision to be taken. And that doesn't only rely on past data, that will rely on a lot of um, factors that are happening right now. Like you cannot, uh, a simple example is you cannot, um, you cannot target the audience the way they were acting in Corona, like they used to act based on past trends, right? The yeah. trends in Corona have been completely different. So I think this is a very great strategy. It's actually how it should be done right now to target people at this moment of time. What did they search? That's why in Google ads and Facebook ads and all these ads, sometimes you feel as if they're listening to you. And actually, in a lot of cases, they are. So uh, so you'll see ads that are very relevant to what you were talking about a moment ago or what you were, who you saw even uh, the day before. And I think that's very important, not only past trends. Past trends is a strategy that is very old. It's, it's like more than 10 years old. Well, I, I would love to carry on this conversation, but we're at time, unfortunately, Fatima. So if anyone wanted to reach out to you to discuss this topic, and I'm sure there will be many, could you let them know where to get in contact with you and what makes a good outreach message to you? For sure. They can get in contact with me via LinkedIn on my profile, Fatima Baz. Um, also, they can get in contact with me on my personal email, uh, Fatima, double T, dot Baz at gmail.com. Fatima, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Tom. Have a great day. Hi, Just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object Podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.